Good evening and welcome to tonight's special meeting of the Board of Education. This is our third consecutive night of superintendent interviews and our, our final one for the first round. We welcome Dr. Wayne Anderson. And I'm happy to be here and I'm glad to have this opportunity to get a chance to meet and talk with all of you. Fantastic. Uh, what we'll do to start the meeting, it's an official meeting, so Mr. Secretary, if you'll call the roll. Gladly. President Wasserman. Here. Vice President Baker. Uh, she's absent, absent tonight. Secretary Kaminsky, I'm here. Treasurer Brandstant. Here. Member Gorton. Here. Member McFarlane. Here. And Member Vanderkellen. Here. Six or seven, I would like to comment on Ms. Baker's absence tonight. She had a long planned uh, trip that was uncancelable without significant, significant financial penalty. Uh, she will be joining us after you're done to weigh in on what she felt about the other candidates as we have our deliberations. Right. Um, so apologize for her not being here, but I want you to be aware of that. Uh, the way we'll go tonight is we're going to take about an hour, hour and ten minutes of asking you questions and you giving us great answers. Um, then we're going to turn the tables and give you ten minutes to ask us questions and hopefully we can give you great answers. Um, in that, we have initial questions that every candidate has been asked. The follow-ups are sort of a random walk depending on the response to get more clarification and understanding as we go forward. Um, and at the end, you'll have your questions. I don't think there's anything else. So if we're ready to proceed, we'll begin. I'll start the ball. Is someone asking them questions? Yes. Okay. Yvonne. All right. Um, start warm up. Let's begin by just learning a little bit about yourself, your broad career path, and the major one or two accomplishments you're most proud of. Well, my name is Wayne Anderson. I uh, grew up in a small dairy farm in northwest Wisconsin. I'm the oldest of five children. Um, after graduating from high school, I went to uh, River Falls, University of Wisconsin River Falls, which is basically a suburb of Minneapolis, St. Paul, uh, Minnesota. And I was going to be a pastor. So I went in and to, uh, I started out in chemistry and pre-law. Uh, shortly after that, I switched into history and English because I had a greater love for those two subjects. Um, so I graduated, um, <coughs> and during my time, I worked my way through school. I was a forklift driver. I was a custodian, I was a gas station attendant, I was um, a carpenter, I was a youth uh, counselor, and I worked uh, for two years as a youth director in a church. So I did an assortment of jobs. My parents uh, raised all of us to be uh, workaholics, so I always tease them. I said, you've taught us all how to work well. Uh, we didn't teach us how to relax quite as well, so that's probably one of my weaknesses that you'll get to later on. Um, after that, uh, when I graduated, uh, since I had changed my mind about being a pastor, and the reason I changed my mind is a little bit humorous, is that uh, I love preaching, I love teaching, I love doing uh, confirmation, I love doing Sunday school, I loved interacting with the kids, I loved interacting with the parishioners, but they had all these night meetings, and I was getting involved in church politics, and I thought, is that what I want to spend the rest of my life doing? So I thought, hmm, I didn't know at that stage if I did, so... I was a uh, graduate, and I didn't exactly know what my next path would be. So the university said, if you come back and work for us, we'll pay for your master's degree. So I said, that's fine. So I came back. I got a degree in uh, history, uh, master's. And I also picked up my education certification. What I did is I wrote newspaper articles for the local paper. Uh, so I did historical research and did newspaper articles. Uh, end up going and doing an internship in history and English uh, in Blair, Wisconsin. Uh, that's where I met my wife. Uh, she is uh, a retired special education teacher of 28 years. Um, so we met, uh, we got married, we taught in two small towns. Uh, one was Castle, which is on the Mississippi River, and then Barneville. Um, one of the things most people know Barneville for is I was here during the tornado, when the tornado wiped out the town and we had to rebuild the school uh, that summer. It happened just a couple of days after school got let out. Um, so as I was teaching, I decided to go back to school, got my degree in administration. So. 1985, I became an administrator uh, at Sheboygan. Uh, Sheboygan is um, a town fairly similar to this in size and population. I was, was called administrative assistant at Sheboygan North High School. That meant I was in charge of all co-curricular activities, all of attendance, and uh, all of fundraising for the school. I was there for three years. I went to Reedsburg uh, for eight years. In Reedsburg, I was an assistant principal at the high school. I was an elementary principal for three uh, outlying elementary schools. And I was the assistant superintendent in charge of uh, business. And then I was, uh, became a superintendent in 1996. Uh, 
in Mount Horeb. I have been there ever since. I've finished 17 years. Uh, what am I most proud of? Um, probably the relationships with the staff. When people move to Mount Horeb, they tend not to leave. So the only reason people usually leave is if their spouse has a job transfer. Other than that, they don't leave. Our negotiations, I'm the head negotiator. Act 10 did put a little change in that for what we were allowed to negotiate. Um, and basically, um, both of our unions, and we have two unions, uh, one is for teachers, one is for all of support personnel. Um, basically, they don't use any outside assistance. Uh, we've been able to uh, settle our contracts in a fast, efficient manner. Not everyone gets everything they want, but when people walk out the door, they both realize the contract is better than it was when they came in. Um, no animosity, so we have very little uh, in the way of um, any type of negative labor relationships. In fact, they're very positive. I think one of the other things that I'm, that I'm happy about is that uh, since the last time uh, that you put my VITA sheet together, we have now passed four referendums on its very first time. We just passed one about a month ago. And it'll be five building projects. So, um, so I have my name on a lot of plaques. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Any follow-ups? That's a great introduction. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to Yvonne, subbing for Lynn. This one's a little lengthy, so if you need me to repeat anything, just let me know. Please describe your leadership, communication style, how you make decisions, resolve conflicts, Work with your executive team, administrators, staff, Board of Education, and move the organization forward. Give us an example of a complex problem you faced and the process you used to resolve it. Okay, well, uh, my leadership is more of what I would say I am one among equals. In other words, I don't have a point on the triangle. What my job is different than other people's job, but it's not more important than other people's job. If all of us work together, then the district goes forward. If we don't work together, the district doesn't go forward, or at least doesn't go forward as fast as it could. But my role is to make sure that all the parts work together so we're all pulling in the same direction. My job is different than other jobs, but it's not more important. And in fact, when I meet with the staff and I meet with all of our various groups uh, every year, I remind them, is the words I never want to hear is say, I am just. It's because you know everybody's role is important. I remind the uh, bus drivers, you are the very first face that people see in the morning. When people are getting on the bus, if you smile at them, if you say good morning to them, you are starting their day off on the right note. You're also the last face they see. So you can help make their day bright in the beginning. You can help finish their day bright. I remind the food service workers that when, we're, when they're serving, they're giving the individuals a healthy meal. That's preparing them <coughs> so they're more apt to learn in the afternoon. And if they do this in a smiling and gracious way, uh, that makes those children happy when they're in the mid part of the day. The custodians interact. Um, you know, a lot of them end up being mentors, um, confidants of various students at various age levels. So I remind everybody has an important role, irregardless of what the role is. We just have different roles. And I try to show them that I respect their role because if for some reason someone needs assistance and I happen to be available, then I usually uh, pitch in. I was just a um, lecturer for the uh, middle school uh, about a week ago on uh, Scandinavian mythology. One is because it's one of my interests. I used to teach that as an English teacher. So I teach that every year to the uh, middle school students, and that happened to be last week. If custodians in the summertime are short because someone is gone, I used to be a custodian. If my work is pretty much done or I, you know, I can at least put it aside, I can I give them a hand. I'll load things and unload things. I can help serve in the kitchen. I have been pat in the hat for the reading. That is a very dangerous job, I will let you know that, <laughs> especially for kindergartners because they love coming up and grabbing the tail. When you have 20 of them grabbing the tail, <laughs> it's hard to keep your balance. <laughs> I also surround myself. So those are some of the ways I re relate to staff. I also take the time to listen. I think probably one of the most important attributes or skills is for people to know that you truly are listening and hearing what they have to say. You may not agree with what they have to say, but if they truly know that you've taken the time to listen to them and to digest what it is and at least to consider their point of view, even if you don't end up changing your mind or changing the decision, they feel that they've been listened to and that brings people a long way. 
in working with my administrative team, so my philosophy is surround yourself with individuals that are smarter than you are. Now, my wife hates when I say that, <laughs> you know? And I always remind her, I said, honey, that does not make me a slouch in any way, shape, or form. However, it's good management. If I, I can't know everything. If I surround myself with people who know mo more than me on particular subjects, and I give them the latitude and the resources to do their job in the way that they know how to do it, the district moves forward faster. My job is to help be a uh, factor of coordination so I can coordinate so that we make sure we're all going in the same direction. Uh, this one, thank you, Sharon. Relations with the community is strong visibility. Um, I try to, uh, you see me at everything. Uh, like I said, I don't have many hobbies. Uh, work is my, uh, it's my hobby as well as my career. I enjoy being with people. And what I've learned is not to let, uh, some people won't come into the school because of things that may have happened in the past that give them some, some phobias. So what I try to do is I try to meet people where they're comfortable. Uh, in our first referendum, and as I said, so far we've been successful in that every referendum we've had has passed at the first time. I think one of the reasons for that is uh, in the beginning of my career, I told individuals, if you have, if you want me to come to your house, I'll be happy to come to your house. You can invite your neighbors, and I'll come and I'll you know, discuss the school, discuss the events that are going on at the school, discuss the referendum and answer any questions that you might have. And all that you have to do is call, and if I don't have a meeting that night, I'll be happy to come over. When people realize that I would actually go and uh, visit their houses now, I do drink coffee, so it was usually coffee and pie or coffee and cookies, and I like both, which <laughs> unfortunately you could probably see when I walked in, <laughs> is that uh, we had good discussions, and people felt comfortable talking in their homes. When they realized that I would literally make myself available to come to their home to talk about issues, uh, that broke down a lot of barriers because some had felt that, you know, schools had meetings, but you always had to come to the school to do them. I was saying, I'll meet with you, but I'll meet with where you're most comfortable. I speak to all the service clubs. I'm uh, involved in several. Uh, I'm willing to laugh at myself. Um, in July, we have a, uh, one of the festivals that we have. Um, it's called the Coffee Stua. Um, that's Norwegian for basically uh, having coffee and dessert. And I am the signboard man. So it's usually about 90 to 100, and I wear this giant signboard, and I walk up and down the main street of town <coughs> talking to people, answering their questions, explaining things. And they get to actually get a quite a bit of uh, humor out of it, watch me walk with this huge sign up and down the road. Um, so I think those are some of the things. If I missed any of the parts, I'd be happy to go back and pick it up. Can you tell us about a complex problem you faced and the process you used to resolve it? I think probably the longest running problem that was the most complex dealt with our primary center. Our primary center is our, is our name for our grade um, one and two center. So it is our oldest building. It was built in 1918. On the site in which it's built, we've had a school there since 1875. Um, but in every one of our building projects, that has been the question. Do we repair the building? Do we tear it down and build a new one? And the community was extremely divided. In fact, I told people the person, the superintendent that tears that building down will be on their last leg. Now, I didn't tear it down. But we had several discussions over the years, and the board couldn't reach a, uh, an agreement on which way they wanted to pursue. So eventually we had a discussion. I said, let's put it to the people. This comes up every time we have. We haven't had resolution. Let's put it to the people, and they will decide. If they want us to repair it, then we'll repair it. So we went out, and we got uh, estimates exactly what would it take to make this 1918 building you know, a state-of-the-art school. Because we didn't want to just fix it up. We wanted, if it was going to be as good as if we built a new school with everything that we could put in. So we wanted to first, could it be made a state-of-the-art school? And if so, what would it cost us? It was cost us about $10.5 million dollars so uh, we had uh, several meetings. So, so I went around talking to, uh, uh, we had some meetings in schools where people come in. We had meetings out in the public uh, to answer their questions. Uh, and we put it to a vote, and it, it won. Now, it didn't win by a large majority. It won probably, I would say, 52 to 48. But once the public had decided, then what I told people, what my job is from this point on is to take the $10.5 million and to create the best structure 
so that even the people who voted no, when they walk in the building, they'll say, you know, we voted against this project, but looking at the results, we're happy. And we did. When it was all done, um, I had to basically move out all the students from that building. So we have approximately 200 students per class. Uh, so we had about just shy of 400 students we had to relocate. And the board asked, can you relocate them? I said, well, yes. So I had to figure out basically finding every nook and cranny of empty space in some of our buildings, uh, renting a couple portables. We moved them out. Uh, we did the interior demolition and then uh, rebuilt it. Uh, they were back in the year. People went through the building. And uh, it was successful in that people that did vote no came through. And uh, the vast majority, not 100%, I did have one person that wanted to tell me that it was a mistake uh, and that the board shouldn't have uh, acted in this way and we shouldn't have pursued it. But other than that one individual, everybody else uh, was very pleased, very happy with what uh, turned out. Uh, so now I think the school district as a whole, we have an uh, educational uh, building that people are proud of and it's taking the, one of the largest issues during my career at Mount Horb and taking it off the table. Thank Any follow-ups? Did you price out a new building? Yes. What was that price tag? Thirteen million. There's only two and a half million dollars difference, and uh, you know that was that we had planned. So we we showed both. Um, I think some individuals in the community felt that if that referendum failed, they weren't they weren't certain whether or not they would come right away uh, back for the new building. So um, I think some voted for that, you know, because the, they knew we needed to do something for our youngest children. So, um, but we did price them both out and there was only about two and a half million dollars difference. Okay. Any others? Yvonne, again. Describe your 90 day plan for entering the district. Please give specific examples of what you would do. Well, the first thing I would do is I would make sure that I uh, sat down with each one of you individually so I could find out your thoughts on the district. What are the things that you are especially proud of? What are the challenges that you see as individuals? Then I sit down and I would meet with my entire administrative team on an individual basis, asking them basically the same thing. I would meet with the Chamber of Commerce. Uh, let's go back one. I would make, I would have uh, basically an open invitation to all of the uh, staff within the district saying, if you would like to uh, have time to meet with me, I'll be happy to meet with you anytime during the day. I can meet morning, I can meet in the evening, I can meet during the day. So anyone during that summer period that wanted to have the opportunity to come and sit down one-on-one -on -one and meet with me, I'd make sure I met with them. I would go to the Chamber of Commerce and start meeting the various business leaders in town so I could find their perspective. One of the things that I noticed in doing research on your district is you've just finished your, um, I call it a strategic plan. Um, you might call it an improvement plan, but it ended at the end of this year. You'll probably be starting a new one. In order to start a new one, what you need is you need basically feedback from the various constituents in the community to find out what are the things that they currently like, what are the challenges that they see, and where would they like to be in the next period of time. Then my job is to bring that information together, present it to the board saying, in meeting with the various subpublics throughout, here's the information that I've gleaned, here's basically a report on what I think this means, what does it mean to you? Where do, would you like to go? How soon would you like to get there? And once I know that, then I would do what I call reverse engineering. I go backwards. So if you want to be, if you're here and you want to be here and you want to be there in five years, then it's my job to work with my administrative staff and the you know, staff in the district and the community leaders to say, in order to get from here to there in five years, here's where we need to be in each of the benchmarks. I need then the board to give me the authority to do that. And then my responsibility is to, to do that to give regular reports to the board to tell them here are our successes, here are the barriers, but here's what we're doing to overcome the barriers. I would be meeting lots of people because they need to know me. I'm The superintendent is the, I hate using the word figurehead because that has sometimes negative connotations, but I am at least, and I can't think of a better term for it even though I'm an English teacher, is that when people think of the school, people will naturally associate me with the school. So they need to see me. They need to have a chance to talk with me. They need to know where I stand on various issues. They need to know how they're going to work with me and how I can work best with them. 
So the more that, and the only way that happens is by sitting down and, and basically talking with people, meeting with them and finding out where you have areas in common, finding out where there's difficulties, and then finding out how those difficulties can maybe be smoothed away. Any follow-ups? We'll move to John. Describe the optimal relationship <coughs> between the board and the superintendent. Discuss a time when you needed to advise a board that it may have overstepped their policy making boundaries and infringed on your role as an administrator. Specifically, how did you manage this? What I do with my board is one is I think the board uh, needs to set what its basic goals are. In other words, there are goals that the board has for the school district. What it is is if I know what those goals are, then we have a discussion, then my job is to you know, basically try to find a way to implement those goals and to give you continual feedback. Um, you need to give me the authority to do that. I need to keep you abreast on what's going on. What I do currently in my district is I write a weekly uh, bulletin to the board. I call it district details. And what it is is uh, it basically tells them all of the highlights that are going on within the district each week. We have board meetings the first and third Mondays. Uh, so the Thursdays prior to that, Basically, I take the entire agenda that we have, write a paragraph on each of the items so that people have a background on what the item is, uh, if there's a recommendation, what the recommendation is, why I'm making that recommendation. If I think that there's controversy or conflict to describe what the two sides of the conflict is, so that individuals, uh, board members, when they come into the meeting, uh, they're pretty much uh, have a pretty good understanding of what's going to take place during that meeting. If things happen, I never want a board member to be caught off guard. I, so if they're going to hear something, I want them to hear it from me before they hear it from someone else. So if we have something <coughs> that happens, um, if we have um, a student get caught uh, selling drugs at school, I will inform the board to say, this was the incident that happened. You know, this will probably be an expulsion hearing, so I can't go into details because our board hears the expulsion hearings. We don't have a hearing officer that does that but to give them the basics so that if somebody says, we saw police cars at the high school Friday afternoon, what were they for? They, can, they have an understanding. We know why they're there. We know that the situation is being handled and taken care of. So um, I don't want board members to be caught off guard. I'll send them emails if we can, but if it <coughs> needs to be, I will give a call so they make sure they hear it from me before they hear it from somebody else. Um, a board conflict. I did have a, um, a teacher who left the district under less than um, optimal conditions that end up being a member of the board. And um, the individual thought they, the individual knew that there was no way that they would end my, that I would ever be terminated from the district because basically I was doing the job that I was asked to do. But the person thought that maybe they could make life a little more difficult for me. So the one time I had made a recommendation to the board, and the board didn't take my recommendation, uh, which can happen. But the local editor of the paper wrote an uh, editorial on why he felt the board should have taken my recommendation. This one board member uh, was irate, uh, called uh, me, wanted, uh, said I was in collusion with the editor, wanted immediate retraction from the paper, wanted an apology, and this was, I think you're talking Friday morning and you wanted it by Friday afternoon. I did have to talk to the board president at that time and say, one, I didn't have any discussions with the editor, but even if I had, you know, what was done was, you know, legitimate. This is what the editor felt to, you know, to basically want a retraction. One, it's not under my power to give that, so, Basically, we discussed in the board it had its next meeting basically was a 7-0 vote, including that individual that said the way I had acted was correct and that the way the board member acted was incorrect and they would try not to have that happen again. It was uncomfortable. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. It was. Thank, thank you for the candor. Yeah, thank you. Any follow-up? Yeah, what, since you're from Wisconsin, what... Are you, what is your board structure there? Is it very similar to what we have here? Right. We have a seven-member board. Um, we have uh, two regular meetings a night. Now we do have a lot less. We have a lot more meetings than you do. Uh, 
which is nice because it, gives me, it would give me more nights to do other types of functions in the community. At one time, we had seven different committees. I attend every committee meeting. And I, in fact, I chair um, from administrator for most of those committees. I take the minutes and I type them up. Uh, so um, for two years, I had a meeting every night for the first two weeks of every month. We've now trimmed it back. We only have four committees and the regular board meeting. So the structure is about the same that you have. But less meetings. I think right now you have two meetings a month, and I think you then have one work meeting. Yeah, we'll have a, a budget workshop. Often we'll have a retreat, um, and um, study committees. Well, we study have study committees. committees. Is study that what you're referring like you to? Your other meetings? Right. Our committees are like building and grounds, um, uh, transportation. We have marketing committees. Uh, we have mm -hmm. education committees. We have personnel committees. We have policy committees. But basically, it's where three board members sit and talk about things in depth and bring it back to the rest mm -hmm. of the board. Yeah, sure. Yeah, we have four study committees. Very, very similar. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Nope. We'll move on to Kim. I know earlier you mentioned your bargaining skills, but can you go further in depth in your experience with collective bargaining negotiations? And what strategies can be used to promote collaborative relationships when bargaining difficult issues? I've been the, uh, up until Act 10, Act 10 in Wisconsin basically eliminated all collective bargaining rights, so the only thing that teachers and support staff can now bargain is base wage, um, and that's it. But prior to that, for the 15 years prior to that implementation, I was the head negotiator for the district with both the unions. Um, I think we had um, good relationships because basically there was a lot of honesty and transparency. And I think they realized that, uh, you know, as the board's representative, the board was never going to take advantage of the staff. So there might be things that we wanted, but we weren't trying to take advantage, and we tried to be as fair as possible. When I first came to Mount Horeb, we were the lowest paying school district in the state of Wisconsin. And there were 400, and at that time, there were 426 school districts. Now we are, uh, in, have a competitive salary with with anyone in the Madison area, and Madison is our state capital, we're 15 minutes from that. So working together, uh, we've been able to um, go through, uh, build up the collective bargaining. Uh, the district has got uh, various things that they felt would make it easier to run the district. Uh, staff got various things that they thought made it more appealing. As I said, one of the things is that staff members don't leave our district. We are basically a big family. I mean, truly, that we have a family structure. Um, in that people realize that we, you know, we look out for one another. If any of our staff members, if, if something happens in their family, the whole district surrounds, and if the person's ill, I mean, there's, auto, there's automatically who will bring meals to their houses, who will do various activities. I mean, that happens automatically. Um, and that didn't happen overnight. One of the, the promises or commitments that I made when I came is that if staff members would do everything uh, that was expected of them to do the best job feasible, then I would do everything in my power to make certain that they had a job in the upcoming year. So in the 17 years in which I've been there, even years when we've got a million to a million and a half dollars, we've never had a layoff. Um, I take that back. We laid off an art teacher part-time because of the number of students taking art at high school. We had two, we went down to 1.6. but. So I think staff members realized when, when truly that commitment was being followed through on an annual basis, they, they come and help us solve uh, fiscal problems. When we had to cut about a million, million five, they basically said, you know, Wayne, we have hoarded little pockets of materials over the years, and we could probably, if we really reduce those budgets, we could get by for a year, and that would basically allow us to save the staffing we still would think we could operate. So they worked with us, and we've been able to do that. So, um, And I think one example is that our support staff used to bring in a representative, but the representative wasn't very competent um, because basically had made several errors. And I told the individual that I can sign this, but if I sign this and agree it or TA it, then what's going to happen is that these employees are actually going to get a wage cut. I said, you know, 
we're not going to do this. You made a mistake in your math. You need to, to redo this. They made another mistake. The person got very upset, slammed their books down, uh, and walked out. But all of the staff members who were part of the team said thanks, Wayne. You know? And after that, they didn't do it because they knew that we weren't going to take advantage of them. We were there to for their benefit. So nobody uses them. We come in. Um, you know, we have some long discussions because sometimes we have different vantage points. But I think the important point is if you listen and you truly see is there a collaborative solution that can be where we can meet somewhere from the two uh, ends, um, people are, are happy that they've been able to at least talk out the opinion. Usually you can always find a solution. Has there ever been a time you couldn't find a solution and you had to make a judgment call? Not with negotiations, but with the budget. Um, there was a time when there was a decision, and my administrative team works with me to put the budget together. So all administrators, we work so everybody knows where every dollar uh, is when we're putting the budget together. And um, the correct decision to be made, um, we operated a um, copy print center in the summer. And we could basically um, have divided that work up and closed down that center. The person who ran that center, if we did that, they would lose their health insurance benefits, and I knew that her husband was ill. And I said, I know that your recommendation is to cut this position. And I know that it truly makes sense from a, from a budgetary standpoint to do that. But from a human standpoint, it doesn't. So even though the administrative team said, this is a cut we want to make, I told them I don't usually play the I am king card very often, but I'm going to play it in this one, and I'm not going to cut that position. Um, you know, eventually, you know, she was able to transition where she could have other medical coverage, and then we could do that. But we, you know, basically, uh, over a two-year period, worked our way into it, so she didn't lose coverage for her husband. So, thank you. Anybody else want to follow up? No, we'll move to Angela. All right. Tell us about one area <coughs> in your district budget that you have had to trim or modify due to budget constraints. And how was that decision reached? And who is involved in the decision making? Well, right now, we're actually doing it right now. Uh, two years ago, uh, we did it. We slashed um, our supplying material budget by $600,000, which um, our budget is very similar to yours, uh, smaller in size. Ours was about uh, $30 million, where yours was closer to, you know, your revenues and expenditures are slightly uh, different from each other. but you know, high 70s, low 80s. Um, what, so there was a pretty substantial cut that we had to make, and the staff worked with us with that. What we're doing right now is health insurance. The Affordable Care Act is causing our district a great deal of headache because, one, prior to this, when we hired many of our employees, we didn't provide them health insurance, but they knew that up front, so many of our paraprofessionals, you know, uh, came to work because their children worked in the district, they had some free time, but we didn't offer health insurance, but everybody knew that up front. Well, now, with the Affordable Care Act, as of January 1, 2014, um, basically, everyone who works 30 hours or more has to be offered health insurance. So we have 51 employees that fell into that category. Um, the measurement period starts on July 1st, and the measurement period is basically for about seven months, then we have an implementation period and then we actually, the people that qualify for health insurance will start in a 14-15 school year. That budget item for us is about three quarters to a, three quarters to a million, three quarters of a million to a million dollars. And, and we just don't have those funds. So what we're trying to work out is what can we do with health insurance to meet, right now we have about a 10% increase, then what will we do to make sure we're prepared for the 14-15 school year? We just put out a survey to our staff basically giving them eight different choices saying which of these do you want us to consider and please rank order them the survey finished on a monday so what we are looking at doing is changing our insurance carrier um, um, and making a couple uh, tweaks to our plan and that'll hold us at cost neutral so that uh, basically we will absorb the whole thing through the plan design and employees won't have to pay more the district won't have to pay more um, so that's what <coughs> we're doing right now, and then we're trying to work out for 14-15. We're making, uh, we know that some of our uh, support staff have to be over 30 hours a week. So that 
we just went out there and said we were already planning it for our budget, how we're prepared to give them uh, the same basic health insurance plan as everybody else because non-discrimination testing basically means that the plan that you offer to your highest, uh, your highly compensated, which is the top 25% of, uh, based on wages, that that basically has to be fairly similar to what's offered throughout the district. So we're basically looking at what can we do for our plan so that in 1415, the district benefit to administrators, teachers, support staff across the board will be, uh, for all practical purposes, the same, and how we're going to uh, actually make that happen in 1450. Where are you going to absorb those teacher costs? Do you know yet? For some of them, we're going to reduce the hours. Um, so I think we've already been working with our paras on that, is that if we put them to 25 hours a week, then they don't, uh, they don't need health insurance. Some of them don't want health insurance because they have relations with their spouse, and their spouse's employer basically says they have insurance, they have to take it. Uh, which would then be a greater financial burden on them. So some are making 30 hours, but some are cutting hours, and basically uh, there may be, we do use attrition. If their person leaves their position, I don't, can, you know, I may not fill that position, but that doesn't mean the person lost their job. It just means that that position will remain unfilled. So we're not there yet, but we're working there. In fact, I prepared the sheets yesterday. My administrative council uh, met at 9 o'clock morning we meet every uh, Wednesday at 9 o'clock and they uh, basically sent out because they know I wouldn't be at the meeting today um, saying okay here's where we're at uh, for the budget here's where the Affordable Care Act uh, you know what tweaks do you see that we need, need to make before we present it to the board again on Monday night I'll send it to the board tomorrow night when I get home so they have uh, Friday in the weekend to look at it before we talk about it on Monday any more follow-ups We'll move to Ms. Scott. Thank you. Given our economic climate, how do you set fiscal priorities regarding the resources needed for educating children? Well, the first thing is to find what your priorities are. I teach budgeting for the University of Wisconsin-Madison, so I've done that for over 10 years. One of the things that I start off with uh, when I teach uh, future administrators about budgeting so the first thing you need to do is you need to put a person's face behind every dollar. Because if you just look at them as numbers, it will give you a slanted perspective. And you want the perspective realizing that every decision you make is going to impact someone. What will those impacts be? What will be the positive impact? What will be the negative impact? If they're negative impacts, what can you do basically to minimize them? And what can you do to, extend it to uh, extenuate the positive influences? So the first thing is you need to find out what are the priorities of the district. As I said, in our district, the priority was was that we would maintain jobs. Not maintain positions, but we'd maintain positions. So that's been the major priority of the board, and, and so we have worked on that. So every year, what we work on the budget is how are we going to make certain that we can basically keep a competent staff? Because when everything is said and done, it's the people that work with the teachers, it's the people that work with the students on a day-to-day -day basis that truly are you know, driving education. My job is to help lead the organization. My administrators help lead their buildings and their departments. But it's the people that work with the, the students on a day-to-day -day basis that truly are the ones that are doing the education. So what we did is we put our focus saying, if we know that this is our main priority, is making sure we can preserve jobs. And our second priority is to make sure that these staff members are as well-trained as possible so they can provide the best education to students. Then we take a look at Okay, what are some of the things that are of a lesser priority that we can, uh, you know, basically, if we have to, eliminate? The trouble is, is that you get to a point when that gets to be very difficult. Uh, we've had a couple of years of cutting. So sometimes there isn't a good decision. So what you do is you work with your staff, you work with the community. And when I mean we, it's the board and myself, to find out what are the priorities that the district has as a whole which are the ones that we can meet, and where does the, which priority do we stop at to say, at this point, we can no longer meet this priority, then you have another question to ask. Do you want to ask the public? We call them referendums. Um, I think you used a different term. You had two of them last night where you uh, put uh, bonds or you put questions to the public. But you ask the public, if we don't have, if this is how much money we have to work with, here are the things we can accomplish with that much money, but here's the things that we'll, we'll take 
we'll take a hit just because we don't have the funds to do that. Um, sometimes you go and you ask the public, if that's important enough, would you give X amount of dollars to do this? Now, in order for that to be successful, one, you have transparency on your web page. In fact, as soon as you open it up on the um, right-hand side, you have a little globe like the world, and you talk about transparency. If people understand how you're spending your money and where the priorities are, they can help make a decision of whether or not they want to fund additional priorities based on what they think are the needs of the district. So um, and if it's a high enough priority, and sometimes you have that money, if it's not high enough priority, then sometimes those areas get cut. Uh, and then you just need to go back and sometimes rethink how you can offer the services. Always try to cut farthest away from the kids. I mean, I think that's a little bit of a, of a mantra that I would work with all my administrators, and I work with my future administrators. Uh, when you have to make cuts, try to make them farther away from the kids. One thing that you can tap into is that I think most school districts don't tap into as much as they can is the budgetary savings. You have probably a great deal of expertise within your staff. You send people probably to a fair amount of conferences and training sessions. Most districts don't tap into the resources they have. They probably have a lot of expertise on their staff. And if you have your staff work together, you can actually have your staff train your staff, which is basically almost of no cost. And it, they feel good because you've recognized their abilities. Their staff trusts them because these are people that are, it's not going to be a day or two and they're going to be gone. They can talk to these people on a regular basis. Professional learning committee, or professional learning community. I am a little nervous. Um, uh, are a good vehicle to have staff members talk with one another, to come to some common understandings and help one another. When, when you're looking at the priorities and when you're looking, working with your administration to figure out what to prioritize, how have you used uh, best practices and data drive that, uh, those priorities? Sometimes we take a look at the programs that we're offering. Uh, I'll use a reading program. Um, we use READ 180. We put that in a number of years ago at the high school. We used it at our, our younger levels, especially at our middle school. Um, and then it was doing the job we wanted to do at the middle school. We were finding the students were having the progress that we expected them to make in the program. We weren't finding that same at the high school. So we were saying, OK. Is this, if this program isn't producing the way that we want it to, can we take those funds and reallocate it to somewhere else that it might have a bigger impact? Mm -hmm. But before we made the cut, we wanted to make sure we were offering the program with fidelity. And what I mean by that is READ 180 suggests uh, that students have 90-minute blocks. Our high school doesn't have 90-minute blocks, so there's 50-minute blocks. So we are trying to do in a 50-minute time period what the program called for for 90 minutes. So before we cut it, we tried to find a way to basically um, what I'll call have two blocks put together for some students so they could have a full 90 minutes. When we did that, we actually found that then we were getting the results. So you know, we saw something we didn't think was serving our needs. We tried to figure out why that was happening. We did so we didn't have to cut. But we take a look at each of our programs to say, you know, how many students are we meeting the needs? And sometimes we've had to cancel programs uh, because the amount of revenue to operate the program wasn't producing the benefit that we thought could be if we moved it somewhere else. Thank you. We cut French. I was watching what one of your do? Board of Education meetings, and I saw that uh, you were recommending a policy for class size, and the board hadn't really thought about it. Did you have a class size policy that you would recommend? Yes, I actually, and it's actually back on the agenda for Monday night. The reason I did that is we had a class size policy, but it only dealt with um, basically minimum numbers, mm -hmm. uh, but it didn't deal with maximums. And the largest discussion of our budget every year with the board is the class size. What will they see as acceptable? So what I did at the beginning of the year and said, and what would make this process much easier is if there could be an agreement right up front what you would see as acceptable class sizes. I said, I don't like hard and fast numbers because if you go by one and it's hard and fast and we have to divide it by two, that may not, first it might not be possible, but two, that might not be the best solution at the time. So we, at the bottom of the policy it has that you know, the superintendent you know, can make exceptions under cases. When they looked at it originally, I don't think they, they had anything with the numbers, but they didn't want to box themselves in. Well, now we're into the budget and of course 
um, about 84% of our budget is staffing and um, staffing and fringes. So we're taking a look at it. Okay, here's what our budget will allow. Here's what our classes are going to be for next year. You know, some class sizes are going to be high. When I present the budget, you know, is that acceptable, or am I going to have to make changes? So then they decide. Well, let's put the class policy back on, and we'll discuss it. So that's on Monday night. Actually, we talked about that after we talked about the budget, so I'm sure it'll be discussed several times. Okay. But it's basically mine was the selfish reason is that if I knew what the board would accept for ranges, it's easier for me then to put that together, and that's one of the hardest parts of budget to put together. Mm -hmm. Reverse engineer that, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Any other questions? Can you give us a practical example of what 21st century learning um, that incorporates technology looks like, either in your vision or what you've actually done? Well, I'm going to actually blend two things in this. First, I think for to have to make sure your education is as effective as it can be, what you have to do is you have to have what I call um, risk taking. You have to allow your staff the opportunity to fail. Staff members have lots of good ideas for how they think they can improve the education in their class. Most of the time, they're afraid to try this because if it fails, they think somehow that's going to have a negative influence. So what we've done over probably the last five, six years is uh, created what I think is a culture of risk taking. In other words, if you want to try something in your classroom, you usually explain it to your principal, explain it to me because sometimes it takes additional resources. We give you the freedom to try that. If it works, great then maybe we can replicate in other classrooms. If it doesn't work, we go back to take a look, why didn't it work? You know, and is there some change we could make that would make it successful? But if we just find that it just didn't work, then the teacher knows they can go back. And instead of, if it, if it doesn't work, instead of having a negative connotation, we give it a positive connotation because at least they're trying. It's like Thomas Edison. He, I think 10,000 tries before he found the right one. He said, you know, he didn't have 10,000 failures. He found 10,000 ways that wouldn't work that made him closer to the way it would work. It's the same idea, is that if you try different things, then you can basically use the intelligence of your staff and their resources to go forward. If you stay in the status quo, you're going to go backwards. I know that one of your goals as a district is you already have a top tier education. Your test scores are already above the state average. Um, you, your achievement gap um, truly isn't that large. It's larger at the high school, uh, smaller in your elementary increase a little bit at middle school at the high school is probably the largest I know your last plan was to basically take that to zero um, not there yet but at least you're going in the right direction so I think you need to allow your staff to try new innovative ways to get better results in their classroom one is people have lots of pent-up um, really good ideas and if you can unshackle them from the fear of failure uh, you're bound to go ahead. I have no doubt in my mind that the district that can uncheck with staff from the fear of failure will make rapid progress just because they do have lots of good ideas. You have, I mean, you hired the best staff members you could to work for your district. You know, now you trust them to, to implement that. But to go with technology, the first thing you need to do, and what we've done, is we're looking at our infrastructure. We would like to go to a one-to-one -one, uh, computer model. Um, not the computer, I would say a laptop. Mostly now we have iPads. What we actually did is for that, we have different pilots that teachers wanted to try on their own. So I said that the, uh, the risk taking is that we have in the elementary, middle school, and high school, different teachers said, you know, we'd like to stop using textbooks. We'd like to try to incorporate this. And we'd like to do it by, um, in fact, one of our fifth grade classes is doing it in English assignment where they're basically writing their scripts. And rather than just having their class at it, they're sending it to other people, you know. Now they're doing it within the district. They're not going outside the district, but it would be a short leap to do that. To have their writing critiqued by other people in the district and then send it back. What we have as an issue is that our infrastructure won't handle that amount of devices. So we've just uh, finished a uh, study for how we can place all of our various nodes. We, we have currently, um, we have wireless access. We don't have wireless saturation. In order to get to the saturation point that would allow basically every one of our staff members and students to operate at the same time, we're going to spend $200,000 um, to refit it. 
So we're trying to figure out. I know that we have about $100,000 left in our budget this year that's unallocated. So one question with the board is, you know, could we unallocate that? That would give us 50%. We could probably build in most of it in, if not the next year, within the next two years so that we could have the backbone. Once you can have the backbone, then bring in the devices, and we would allow students to bring some of their own devices in. Uh, we'd probably credit all of our staff members with a dollar allotment so they could buy and own a device uh, from a list that our tech department realized that if they were to break down, we would be able to fix that. How do you manage for students that can't bring their own device? We would provide those for them. And budget for that comes from? Basic supplies and materials. We have, you know, in our technology budget, we budget for classroom sets every year to make those classroom sets available. Probably in a, we'd probably try a checkout basis, but if they needed to take them home, we'd probably check them out for a year, maybe put a small retainer of like $50 so that if there was some damage, we could repair that. But we did a survey within our district, and probably about 92% of our district has the wireless, or not wireless, but has access to the internet at home. And almost every child has some type of an electronic device irregardless of um, the means of their family. Um, even in kindergarten, they have cell phones and they know how to use them. And they know how to use them better than I do. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. no? So um, beyond the devices and having the infrastructure, what skills would you look for with the students developing from having the, uh, the technology enhancement? basically how to make decisions with those. In other words, not, you know, if it's just going to be an elaborate chalkboard, we're really not going to get much out of it. So what you need to do is you need to basically have them like a research project. Say, you know, here's the question. Where are the resources that you need to get to put those together to give a presentation to the class to defend your idea? And then have the teacher basically serve as the coach and the model person to bounce it off. So. We had a class at one time where it dealt with World War II. We had to take certain battles, had to determine, you know, what happened at that time, if things would have been different, would the outcomes have been different, and then we basically uh, present and defend the position, and other people took, and took the opposite side. So you had to uh, defend your position. Projects like that, so people have to, one, find a way to gather the information. And they already have a grasp of it. You just need to have them hone those skills. And to realize that not everything that comes that they find on the internet is factual, I think that's probably one of our uh, our largest downfalls is that we still have too many of our students. When we took a look and basically look at where they were, that have uh, they can't just they can't do a good enough job of detailing what's an opinion and what's a fact, just to believe that because somebody put it in print didn't make it a fact. So. I think you need to teach those skills so people can say when I'm bringing different types of material, which of the materials are truly opinions, which are facts, how can I tell a difference, and how would I use each one in an appropriate way? Um, any experience, um, we're looking at, uh, I hate to call it a brand name, but a pro uh, system called New Tech, where it's more collaborative learning, different way of uh, delivering education than it's traditionally done. Any experience in that arena? I don't know about new tech, but it, what it sounds a little bit like is you're talking something that's considered called flipped classrooms, and what I mean by that. Mm, yeah. Project-based learning. Project-based learning. Okay. More. I know project-based learning, yeah. yes. I don't know that form, but I know what project-based learning is, yes. Um, Have you done any? Any impl our, implementation in your district? Our high school classes, certain classes, especially certain types of our AP classes, work with parts of that, uh, because they, as they prepare for the AP test, if they find out if they can take the information that they need and solve a problem, they learn the material actually faster than they would if it was just, you know, a lecture and regurgitation. Okay. Um, moving on to Lynn, Yvonne. Share any experience you may have had in establishing equity for children with differing needs, implementing the response to intervention model, and developing and evaluating gifted and talented. Gifted and talented programs, I'm sorry. First of all, my, as I mentioned earlier, my wife is a special education teacher. She was for 28 years. My daughter is a special education teacher. 
So if there was ever a time in my life when I wasn't sensitive enough, they made certain to correct me. Um, uh, in fact, my wife actually, uh, when we taught together, um, I wouldn't send my special ed students down to her. Uh, the reason for that is I said, "Hun, I know English better than you know English. I love you with all my heart, but I know this better, and I know that I can get to every one of these kids in my class and have everyone. So I don't need you to do that because I know that I can do that for them, and I could and because people will perform to your lowest level expectations. If people understand that you truly believe in them and you truly think that they can succeed and that you're there to help them succeed, they will go above and beyond to make certain that they achieve at those levels. If you, conversely, if they believe that you don't think they can succeed, that will also be a fact. So that's just a little bit of, I guess, philosophy. We implemented RTI probably about uh, four years ago, four to five years ago, we've actually been major presenters at some of the Midwest conferences. So in response to intervention, and we have worked with the various interventions. Uh, so I, I think you all know RTI basically is the concept that 80% uh, of your students should have their needs met through the regular curriculum. If they don't, there's a second tier of interventions. So maybe for the next 15%, there's probably 5% that would be on a third tier of intervention. We have actually interventions for both the uh, students that struggle and for the gifted and talented because we found out the individuals who are most likely to drop out of school are the gifted and talented individuals who are being bored. So what we have, we actually have plans for them. Um, and you know, our individual plans might be that uh, they, uh, one of the easiest is sometimes we can move them up in a class. And they're not usually across, some might be in math, some might be in science, but we can basically take them if they are a talented fifth grader Maybe we can move them to a sixth or seventh grade class, and we can work that in the schedule. Uh, some have foreign language, so they actually are, you know, taking uh, at the elementary level and school at the high school level. Um, we have at the high school level, we actually have quite a few resources for gifted and talented, um, so that if we don't offer something uh, either through AP um, or through an online, we actually have um, agreements set up with the universities, and we have several universities within about 15 miles that they can go to the university and take classes. Parents love it because actually uh, we have a number of students that leave with almost a year's worth of college credits, um, either through AP or through going to uh, uh, the university to pick up those classes uh, before they leave high school. So we look at the intervention for both those children that struggle. And I believe that every individual, irregardless of age, every one of us have a disability and every one of us are gifted and talented. We all have things that we shine in, that we excel in, that we're better in than others. We also have things that we are weak in. I think what the goals of schools is to work with people to make sure that we, you know, strengthen the gifts so we can make sure that the gifts that people have, that, you know, they can use it to the greatest extent and we minimize people's weakness. Did that answer your question? Mm -hmm. Any follow-ups? Describe your knowledge and any specific experience you may have had in implementing and evaluating IB programs. We belong, um, Mount Horeb uh, created a, um, we are a part of what's called the Global Academy. The Global Academy was several school districts in the uh, Dane County uh, region that we got together and we said, what are areas that none of us are offering on our own, or if we are, or some of us can offer it, that we can work together and pool our resources and pool our students so that people can go to other. We started this about seven years ago. It took us two years to get it off the ground, but International Baccalaureate Programs was one of the programs we discussed. It actually is in one of the, the schools. It's in the Madison schools and in the Middleton, so that if we have a student who wants to, we can send them there so basically we use each other's resources. I know that you have the International Baccalaureate program at the high school. I know this next year you're going to start at the elementary school. It's a different way of um, you know, basically looking at how to solve problems and connections. So we tried to do that. It actually has been really successful for us because it's of, there's very little cost uh, to any of the districts because we pool our resources and pool our instructors. But it, it expands the number of classes that we can offer. Now this for us is at the high school. So, but 
transportation was the one issue, but since basically the farthest that anyone would have to drive is probably 20, 25 miles, it's, uh, you know, it's a, an area that we can overcome. So that's how we use what we call the local education. The one thing you have here in, in your community is that, you know, with being headquarters of Dow Chemical, you already have a whole industry that has international um, connections. That, you know, they know if you tap in basically to, to the leadership from Dow Chemical, you can find out what is it that people need to succeed not only in this country but in other countries. So when we talk about global competition, in your personal experience, what are the things that you have found that your employees needed to be successful? And then if you work with them, there's ways that you can implement so that you can provide them with better employees. Not better employees, but you can provide them with employees that you know, already have some training on the things that they'll need uh, you know, to compete internationally. I mean, it's, you know, sidestep back a little bit. Schools have got an extremely, um, are taking hits for things they shouldn't take hits for. When we are compared globally, people always say that we are 17th in math, 18th in science. The bottom line is, is if you take the research and you take the same tier level of students uh, in the United States and in the other countries, our students actually perform higher than their competitors across the world. We still produce the best students in, you know, in the world. But we do forever. We try to offer education for all children. That's why our statistics look different. So the idea that we're not as competitive uh, just isn't true, which is that we're trying to make a larger group of people competitive, which is, I think, what our whole nation was founded on, is opening doors through education. I know that it worked for me and for my family, and I think we're working for others. So I know that's a step back, but it's, it's just key when we talk about international um, education, globalization. Sometimes we get a rap for not being as good as others, and the research actually points out when you take the same demographic students, that's not the case. Sorry about that. How many students from your district are, are going into Madison and getting either a diploma or certificates for classes? I will bet our, most of them are juniors and seniors. One is because they have driver's license, so they can actually drive in. I would say our average class size is, well, I think we have about 200. I would say probably almost 25% of our students go to take some type of a, of a class of some. Now, we also have apprenticeship programs. So the outside education isn't just going to the college. We have apprenticeship programs set up with a wide variety. We have one of the largest, uh, um, basically, um, genetic um, companies that actually is in our back door. So we send students there for training. Uh, we apprentice students out. We have a building trades program where we design a house every spring. We build it uh, every fall. We have the longest running builder in Mount Horeb. So we have a series of apprenticeship programs where people work with the trades. So when I count that, it's probably well over 25, probably, I don't want to say 50%, but maybe 33%, a third of our staff that will get training outside of you know just our teachers. John. Yeah, well, I just wanted to say I appreciate your uh, digging into the fact that there's, some on, there's not an apples to apples comparison. I get asked that a lot about um, about education, how we compare globally. And that's very comforting to hear that, because uh, we don't hear that enough. <laughs> Absolutely. OK, um, what experiences have you had in helping a school district develop or modify the priorities of the district? What I usually do is, one is, as I mentioned earlier, I try to make myself available to listen to people. So when you listen enough, you get an idea, a sense of what people think are your, are your strengths and your weaknesses. So what we do is in working with the board, we try to determine, OK, what are the areas? Here's where the community thinks that we're at. Here's where basically our staff thinks that we're at. Here's where you think that we're at. When we put them together, there are actually quite a bit of overlap. Then we'd say, what is it that we want to concentrate on? We can't do justice to concentrate on five, six, seven items. We just don't have the time or the manpower or the resource to do that. 
what are the top three things that you want to work on? So then basically it's going through a discussion saying, if these are the seven areas we think that we'd like to work on, then basically sometimes it's even as unsophisticated as, you know, putting all seven down, everybody saying what's your first choice, second choice, third choice. I mean, there's different ways to try and determine if we can't do all seven, what are the top three that have, you know, a majority of support uh, from the board? Because we've already got these ideas from the public and the staff. And then to go forward and then determine, okay, what does each one of these take? Sometimes uh, they don't take uh, as much fiscal resources as it may take time. So we have to figure out how we will we'll modify schedules. So that's probably the most common way. What they're actually going to do with their brand new superintendent is, um, and I think this will be very beneficial. We're going to have a brand new board, a brand new superintendent. They're going to um, basically meet this summer to go through the same exercise, determining what is it that we want to put as our top three priorities. And then the new superintendent will then work out what she feels is the plan to get that. I'll review that with the board and then we'll go into implementation. So it's like people call things strategic plans. I rather call them strategic planning because too many variables can change. <coughs> if you have a strategic way of looking at things, then you can continually modify your plan. So each year it might get modified depending on the circumstances. I called your, uh, your board president and said, <coughs> how does that process work? Uh, how's the community aligned on those priorities? What would they tell me? What he, he or she tell me? I think he would tell you that the community probably aligns pretty well. It's probably a bigger struggle for the board than it is for the community because of diverse opinions and the, what um, various board members hold as their strongest priority. He would probably tell you the larger struggle is coming to consensus for the top with the board than it is with the community. Any other questions? It's not that the board doesn't get along. It's just that, you know, the there are seven <coughs> different personalities. They have different things that are of most importance to them that they would like to see addressed earlier rather than later. Kim. Can I, can I ask a follow-up yeah, question? Yeah, 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 sir, Scott. How do you deal with that interplay uh, with the board where your members have different, differing priorities? And how does that well, spill over into your realm of administration? The first thing is I try to do everything for everybody. So, but that's <coughs> only, I mean, that's only limit. I mean, as many things as I can make happen, then I'm going to make happen. And I'll try to bring back a plan to determine how many. But when it's just, it's just not feasible, we just don't have the resources, then basically it's, it's working with that individual. Usually it's on a one-on-one -on -one basis sitting down saying, I know that this is extremely important to you, and I know that it doesn't seem to be one of the focuses. But it's not that we've lost sight of it. It's not that we're not dealing with it. It's just that at this point, these are taking a little bit more uh, of the resources and time because that's where the majority of the board would like us to spend the time. But it doesn't mean that, you know, that your issue isn't important. It doesn't mean that we're not working on your issue. Uh, it just means that it's not in the same level as what the majority has felt, the issues that they want the board to work on at this point. Yes. Okay. That meets with very few. Sometimes, you know, the person truly understands. Sometimes it takes a little longer to come to an understanding. I mean, I think the best thing I have going with my board is that they realize that I'm, I'm totally honest with them and that, you know, if I can do it, I will do it. But if I can't, I'm going to tell you that I can't. Not that I'm, you know, putting it aside, but at this point we just don't have the means to do that. But I try to make those as infrequent as possible. Tim? Okay. Um. Discuss your knowledge and any specific experiences in helping a district measure and report its own progress towards a strategic vision. Well, we this is just kind of a thing that we do. Um, the first thing is what we do is we work on our priorities, as I mentioned before. So in the strategic vision, what are the priorities of the district? Uh, Sometimes we call those the goals, sometimes we call those the priorities. And then we reverse engineer where we're at and where we want to be, and we give updates. We find out who's responsible for what areas, so it's a little bit like your strategic plan, except that strategic plans are usually long. In fact, I think your document was 81 pages. 
So my guess is after you get through the first few, very few people understand. So I try to make sure that we can condense things to one or two pages. People will read a page or two. People won't read more than that because we just have too many things demanding our attention. So try to bring it down. If here are the three things that we're working on, here's where we're at, here's where we want to be, and then basically here's the plan, and then reporting back on that plan. Um, we're not different than the other district is that we want to we want to close achievement gaps. Um, we want basically to get more of our students that uh, right now they call them advanced and proficient. Wisconsin just underwent a change. We used to give what was called the Wisconsin Knowledge and Concepts Exam. Wisconsin had rated where you would be advanced and proficient at different levels. Now that uh, with the Common Core, we're trying to basically put those uh, with NAEP, which is the National uh, Educational Progress. Um, so the scores went down. So we had to you know, basically talk to parents and saying, it's not that the students know less this year than they did last year. It's just that when they made the cut scores, the cut scores are much more challenging. So it's more difficult. But we're all family. The goal is still to get the individuals here, and here's the plan for getting them. I also write blogs, so I like to write, um, probably because I was an English teacher. So what I noticed a couple of years ago is that the standard way we get out information to people, and this would just be one example, was you know your newsletter, um, articles in the paper. It was missing a large chunk of our um, our populace. So I said, you know. I'll create a blog. We'll just put it on my website, on our website, and people can tap in. So I started about four years ago. The um, and it's not that I write something on every week. What I do is, that, is issues are of importance. I put it out so that people know they can go and if they're interested in health insurance, if they're interested in our budget process, if they're interested in snow days. I mean, you get to the question of the worst day in my life. I'll have a great snow day. Story <laughs> for you. But we. Uh, but I type the blog to provide people information. Um, my own little um, measuring stick is that I make sure I tell the board first so that when it goes to the general public, the board is already, you know, knows what we're talking about, so it's nothing that hasn't been shared with the board uh, in advance. But people find this is, um, is a great way to get information. I didn't think people were reading it. I mean, because only like one or two people ever make a comment, so I really thought, I was spending a, a fair amount of my time writing articles that nobody read. So I actually asked the technology department, says, anybody read this thing? I said, yeah, only 5,000 people a week actually read your blog. I said, oh, <laughs> that's all right. <laughs> nobody comments. Um, so the next thing that um, we would do, and what I would probably do here, since you have access to the TV station, is probably put a video clip. I'd still do a blog, but a video clip uh, that people could watch. Uh, you already do your board meetings. It's easy access. I actually watched a couple of your board meetings. One is to see what your boardroom and uh, what you all look like. <laughs> I saw your picture, but to see in action. Um, so I would probably do a, uh, not only a blog that some people like to read where they can you know, sit and dissect, but also do a, uh, a news clip so to tell people so they could do it orally. Um, I hate getting my picture taken, to be real honest. Uh, one is because mirrors are too realistic. and. My vision, what I look like, and the mirror's vision are not always <laughs> the same. But I think it's a good way to get information out to people. And I think the more ways you can get information to people and the more informed they are, uh, the better it is for the school uh, and the community. And now, would you do a class size presentation um, each semester? Or, I mean, do you show that to your Board of Education for the dis across the district class sizes? Yeah. In other words, when we do, after the board talks about it on Monday night, this probably this next week I'll have a couple. One is because we have a huge agenda on Monday. I told my, in fact, I was speaking to some of my staff members. So just you know, just tell your spouse you're not going to be home because by the time we finish, <laughs> we, we're going to be starting the next day. <laughs> There's just lots of issues. But what we'll do is we'll take the ones that people are most interested in, and I'll create a blog summary of what it is so that health insurance is obviously one of the things that most people are interested in, so that they can say, okay, so what are the changes? What were the votes? What action is the board going to take? And what impact will it have on me? Class size is also on there. So as I talk about the budget, I'll talk about where our class sizes are at this point. It's my goal to have our budget approved the first meeting in June, which would be June 3rd. One is because it's my last board meeting. Um, so And we traditionally uh, had the budget approved at the time. So then I could put on the 4th, I could send out one so everybody would understand here's the budget that was passed. 
to hear the impacts it has on the individual. Do you do reports on building capacity? Yes. Yep. So we know at each one of our, none of our buildings are at capacity yet, but we've had several where we've done additions. Our middle school is the next one that will have to have something done. There already, we have a couple proposals already that we've discussed. One is we do actually have a design to increase the space. Our middle school is done in spokes. We have three spokes. When we did our last building project, we actually put at the end of each spoke uh, two classrooms, but we did them in such a way that we can connect the spokes together so that then the spokes will all connect and we can add another, I think we estimated about 200, 250 students, which would put us off for a couple more years. Uh, we also built our last new elementary school, which is our intermediate center, grades three through five. We built that into a hill, so we actually graded it so we could add another, we could add on to the one wing that goes out, so we could add another um, class onto that uh, fairly inexpensively. The other option they have is the one that we have discussed that's basically of no cost to them as far as fiscal cost, but it, was, it's a, it will have a great uh, political cost, and that is to take sixth grade out of the middle school and to put that back into the elementary schools and to shift. Right now, all we have no attendance areas, so that is one issue I do not have to deal with because all of our students in the same grade go to the same school, but we break it up. All of our kindergarten and uh, early childhood go to one, then all of our first and second grade go to one, then all three, four, and five go to one, six, seven, eight, and nine through 12. We could make two of them attendance area schools, bring the sixth grade down, then seventh and eighth, we wouldn't have to do anything at the middle school, there's plenty of room, but there's a lot of resistance from both staff and parents about doing that, so then you weigh the fiscal cost with the, what I call the social cost, and I don't know how that one will play out, because. That will be one I don't have to decide. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Angela. Oh wait, let me, can I do a follow up? On oh that? sure, I'm sorry. <coughs> okay, so when you're talking about capacity and stuff and you're talking about adding on, is your school district growing then? Is that what's yes. causing this? Okay. We've People, are they migrating out of Madison? And we have them uh, for 17 years. We've grown every year except two. Okay. One year we were just flat, and one year we actually went down by 30 students, or else our average increase is about 49.8, just shy of 50 students a year. Um, and the reason that that happens is because uh, parents tell other parents when they're, they're going to have children, is, and they can select where they want to go. And we have great schools around the Madison area. I mean, Dane County has lots of great schools. But when they get to choose which one they want, we have parents telling them, you want to have your children come to this school because that's when they come. So our community grows. Our realtors always tell us that we are the best salespeople that they have because people say we are moving to Mount Horror because of the schools. And that's the same here. I mean, I am certain that people move to this community because of your school district. It's not just, I mean, the school is one part of the larger community. But when people have a place and can make a decision about where they want to live, one of the things they're going to look at is the schools because Children are still people's most prized possession. I've never yet met a parent who said, you know, we're, you know, just here the child is, you know. Irregardless of where things may be in any home situation, when they send you their child, they're sending you the best child that they have, and they want you to take the best care of that child. And the better job that you can do, the more parents want to send their children there. So, you know, I think it's more of a, we have a moral obligation to do the very best job we can, to the very best job we can for each of the children coming to our building. And if we do that, more children want to come. The good thing is, more children come. The difficulty is you run out of space and you have to figure out how you're going to deal with it. Okay, thanks. And then, yeah. We're, we're okay. getting close on time. Um, do you want to your, skip your this question one and kind go? Yeah, yes, your question's kind of answered. Can yep, we go to Scott? Scott, can you Definitely. do your last question? Sure. Last question. So can you tell us why you think you'd be a good fit as a superintendent here in Lincoln Public Schools? And the second part to my question is, based on your research, what do you think are the most significant issues facing Lincoln Public Schools, and how would you begin to deal with them? Well, let me go to the second part first, sure. and then I'll go. One, in trying to read everything I can about your community. I've went through your website as many ways as I can go through it. Um, reading documents. I went through every other site I could about the Midland community to try to figure out all the things. 
my business manager said, what he really liked was they got a semi-pro baseball team that plays in the same <laughs> league as Capitals. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a winner right there. <laughs> the, but I think, the is, I think some of the issues that you have right now that you're dealing with as a school is one is currently you don't have much diversity, but your diversity is growing. So as your diversity grows, you're going to have to find ways to deal with the diversity because you're going to have more needs or, or different types of needs, and you're going to find solutions to meet those needs. Two is you're, you're basically you have an, an unbalance between the revenue that's coming in and your expenditures. Right now, I call them a fund balance. I think you call those a sinking fund. Yeah, fund um, yeah. You're right, fund balance. Fund balance? It's is your fund balance is going down? Okay. In other words, so sinking. that you're drawing out of <laughs> it. Is sinking. But it is sinking, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I always, when I, when I actually talk to people outside of um, education, I usually refer to it as, you know, checkbook, savings account, mortgages, things that they can always understand. So basically, you're dipping into your savings to, to pay the operational expenses from your checking account. You can only do that for a certain period of time. It's just not a way that, so you have to find a way to put in balance. You get very little federal dollars. You only get about 2% of your aid is from the federal. The average is about 7. You only get 2. Um, you're getting most of your aid um, from the state. But as the state gives you aid, it has certain conditions. And you know it's not always a reliable source of income, as we've learned in Wisconsin, is that when once uh, we were under the belief that we would get two-thirds funding uh, for schools, uh, that now uh, overall is probably down to about 60% as a state. Um, we probably get uh, in the high 50s, um, so, uh, and we were frozen. In fact, this year we're not frozen. We are actually cut $500 per student, so we had to find a substantial sum of money. Uh, this year, currently, our governor's budget is frozen, so we'll have no resources. So, I mean, one is to find a way to balance between your revenues and your expenditures. I noticed in reading the various surveys that went out to the staff that I don't want to say there's a disconnect, but I think one of the things that the staff would like to see is um, more involvement from, you know, from maybe the level. So, you know, I think they would like a superintendent, and I don't know your current superintendent, and I have not one. So this is not a negative, but in just reading it, it looked like they would um, relationships. I guess would be a, a generic term. Uh, so, you know, someone that can create relationships. I think you want someone that has good communication skills, uh, both oral and verbally, to to deal with your various publics. Um, one of the issues that you just had, and I tried to find out, um, you had your two referendum questions yesterday. I found out when I got here today that uh, they had failed. So probably one of the things you're going to have to do now is determine uh, what was it that made the failure. I think one of your votes was very close, and determine how you can deal with that. So sometimes it's just uh, providing maybe information in different formats to publics to find out, you know, what their concerns are. Or maybe it was just you didn't have a very large voter turnout and maybe it's just an encouragement. But to find some way to deal with those two issues, because I know technology, yeah, you want to put more money in technology. Right now you don't have the funds, so you have to either make some determinations on um, either finding an alternative way to uh, fund the technology project or what pieces that you wouldn't want to do at this time. I think those are some of the challenges that you have. Um, I think some of the skills that I have as a superintendent is, is one, I, I think I'm a very good communicator. I like to speak um, to large or small crowds. Uh, and basically, I'm very shy. People don't realize it. My knees are shaking tremendously. That's why <laughs> I really like, you know, cloth so they don't show as much. <laughs> but I like dealing with people. Uh, obviously, this is a little more, you know, uh, of a different situation, but I think relationships, uh, finding a way to establish, um, you probably have very good relationships right now with the community, but what ways can they be you know, strengthened? How can you get their ideas and input in? And I think that I, I had a practice of doing that uh, over my career. Um, you want somebody with some longevity. Now, I know that people are always looking for, why did you retire from Wisconsin and would come here? So I will answer that question for you. Our Wisconsin's pension system and retirement system basically says that once <coughs> you're 57 years old, I've spent my entire career in Wisconsin, that at that point you have maxed out your pension for all practical purposes. Uh, 
it doesn't encourage you to work any more than that. Um, I think fairly fiscally astute, I understand that, but I don't want to quit working. Um, I don't know what I would do if I didn't work. Um, this is what I love to do. I mean, I love working with people. I love solving problems. Someone once told me that the, you know, the more active you keep your mind, you're pushing off Alzheimer's. I'm hoping to push it off well into my 100 plus. This is what I enjoy doing. Um, if I was fortunate enough to be selected as your superintendent, I would guarantee you I would stay a minimum of eight years, maybe longer than that, depending on, um, as long as it was beneficial for both of us. One, because I don't think my energy has depleted at all. Uh, I don't think I have any less passion I do now than I did uh, when I came in, uh, started 17 years ago. I think I've learned things during my 17 years that make me use my time better and that make me maybe not make some mistakes I made uh, earlier in my career just because, you know, experience is a good teacher. And sometimes you learn from your experiences on things you should modify or change to be more successful in the future. Um, I know that I'm missing a lot of things that I plan to say, but I just don't know what they are right now. Well, <laughs> let me give you a little a follow-up twist to the question um, that may trigger some of that. What attracts you to Midland? One is you have very good test scores. I mean, you're already at a, you're already a district that <coughs> I think one of the questions put it, you're a district at the cusp. In other words, I'm certain that what your end goal is, is if anybody moves to the state of Michigan and they can pick anywhere to live in this state, you want them to choose Midland because of the school district and because of the community and those two are intricately tied together. What is it that you need to do to bring your school district from where it is now to where it would be so that when they say what is the most premier school district in the state of Michigan or in the United States, they're going to point to your district. So my goal would be to find out first where what are the differences right now between what you would consider an elite district and yourself? What are those differences and how could those differences be met? And most of the time they can be met with the things you already have. As I said, the greatest resource to tap into is the people that currently work either in your district or work in your community. You already have lots of areas of expertise. It's just sometimes asking people and giving them the opportunity to share their expertise. Any more follow-ups? Oh, I was just wondering, you teach school finance at University of Wisconsin. Is that just for the state of Wisconsin, or do you teach um, the rules for all the states? Well, basically I teach budgeting. Uh, so okay. what I teach is how would you go about setting up budgeting, what's the budgeting process. And irregardless of the state, we do, uh, I do have a couple lessons where I talk about, you know, the various differences in the state. Mm -hmm. uh, but primarily it's the process because that doesn't change. I don't know your system as well as I know Wisconsin system. That's a fact. But I don't need to know your system that well on day one because you already have a business manager who already knows that system. What my goal is is to tap that individual to, so that I make sure that you know I understand the differences so I know where we need to go. Like I said earlier, my goal is to surround myself with people that are more intelligent than I am because I know I can't be an expert in all things. Mm -hmm. So if I surround myself with those individuals and I give those individuals basically the authority and responsibility to carry out their mission, one, they feel much happier because they're doing what they want and they don't feel as constrained. And I feel more productive because I know that I don't have to, you know, micromanage or watch because I'm hiring a person that I know or I have a relationship with the person that I know they're doing the best job that they can and they're keeping me informed about any issues, positive or negative. And I had looked at the school finance rules from Wisconsin and Michigan, and they're very similar. We are switching over to the Common Core. And that is going to have issues. One thing with the Common Core, I don't know much how time I have for that, but one fallacy with the Common Core is that people think of that as being the level. Common Core is the basement. Common Core is the minimum that you, that you would offer to show the some similarity between all the states. Districts still will take a look at for their own personal population, what is it they want to do above and beyond that? And somehow as I enter in discussions, people are thinking, well, this is going to basically, you know, um, totally undermine our current system. And the answer is, that's not true. This is the floor. You still will build on that the things that you think are important for your district. 
you to agree with that, I think. Um, time for me to have you turn the tables. Um, <coughs> what questions do you have of us? Well, the first question I have is your two referendum questions did fail last month. Why do you think that might be? I, I think it's a little premature until we dig into data to answer that question. Okay. Um, but there is one unmistakable fact, and that was turnout was very light. So one of the key questions has to be asked of why was turnout very light, and then you start from there. And uh, obviously with less than 24 hours, we're just beginning to understand that. If you were to take a look at where, um, where you're right now, what are probably the two major things that you want the superintendent to work on when he or she gets here? What are your top two priorities, either as individuals or as a collective board? The budget is going to be first. Yeah, that's your expertise. So, I, I would say, uh, you know, with the the changes that have occurred in the past few years, in our next chapter going forward, I describe it as an innovative chapter in Midland Public Schools, and how to unite the the district around and get them rallied around it, that vision, and uh, some of that strategic plan and so forth. And the other thing, because of the at-risk student population is changing, Midland is changing. Uh, Michigan's had a lot of effects because of the economy. Um, how do we how do we look at innovative and creative ways to address those at-risk students' needs? We we have some good uh, models or projects that can be expanded. A lot of that uses the community, community-based uh, kind of a fusion between schools and in the community. I would think just that we work to stay ahead of the curve, not behind the curve. And <laughs> education is changing so fast. We definitely need someone who is up on all that and can really make sure that our vision is ahead of the curve and we're not lagging behind. I agree with, with everything that was said. It was really just driving innovation and, and bringing us into the 21st century. With what Kim said. Sitting there right there is the <laughs> elephant in the room. <laughs> and, uh, that, that's, and that is the conundrum that you probably face in your own district at the same time. I mean, I think taking a look at what your projected budget is for next year, I think you're looking at taking your fund balance down by what, about $2.5 million? And we have our budget workshop Monday night, Monday, I should say, um, for looking at the, the next school year and, and what that means. I think your current fund balance was about 13.5 percent, and are you going to take it down to about seven percent? I'm trying to remember as I was trying uh, to remember quickly in my head. Original. Not, not in. Yeah, that's yeah. original. Um, it won't get into the arcaneness there. Okay. Um, uh, but bottom line is, we are still spending. By any way we slice the budget, we still spend more than we bring in, and the state dictates what comes in, and we have very little flexibility in Michigan on what we can go for referenda, as you described in Wisconsin, for operating expenses. We can do it for capital, we can do it for technology, uh, but for operating expenses, uh, it's a very, very small sliver we can ask the voters for. So we're, we're capped to a large degree what we can do on the operating revenue side. Okay. I think those are the questions. Other than student, student count, which as we become more attractive, you know, we are attractive, but if we can become more attractive, uh, that would help on the revenue side. Actually, your unemployment is a lot lower than the state average. So I mean, yes. you have I think only five, little over five, between five and six percent unemployment, which is, you know, much lower yep. than your average for the state. So the vast majority, and I think that the, when I took a look at the educational structure, as far as you know, many of your citizens are well educated, and many of them are you know have a wage that is you know exceeding state average. So you have a lot of the basics, you know, to make things happen. Um, it, it did great risk. What when we learned when we um, did the focus groups, and I think Dave learned is we are a very interwoven community. Uh, you know, many communities there's schools, there's this, and there's that, and and yes, we have our I'll call our subdivisions, but this is a unique community in terms of how really interwoven those all are between the major corporations, the foundations in town, uh, uh, schools, city government, 
Uh, these things are vastly interwoven and everybody's in everybody else's business, uh, which works very effectively. And we have a very uh, high expectation town uh, by, for the reasons you just described. And so how do we stay in front of that curve as our demographics change a little bit um, going forward? And only it, the demographic that's changing is not just, I'll call it the diversity, uh, it's the age distribution is changing. We are an ever aging community. Uh, the percentage that's uh, my age, your age, is growing. And the percentage that is um, what many of these people on the table would be that uh, that can have children uh, is shrinking. And that becomes the conundrum on, on student count here. I'm also a storyteller. That means I find the best ways to convey information through stories. So you mentioned age. Um, kindergartners are the most honest of all individuals. And I was in our kindergarten center and was lucky. And one of the young boys, this just happens to fresh in my mind, is I thought he wanted to high five, but he didn't want to hug. So he jumped up. So and I said, oh, you, I'm going to have to work out if I'm going to be able to hold you. And he said, oh, I'm almost six. And then I said, well, you need to tie your shoe because you know it's untied and I don't want you to trip. So I know how to tie my shoe. So I bent down and I tied his shoe and he goes, oh, six. Your hair is all white on top. <laughs> <laughs> that means you're old. <laughs> I said, I guess that's what it can mean. So when you mentioned age, so that, that was one of the recent ones. Yeah. So <laughs> that's one of the population demographics which <laughs> we're seeing in town. So thank uh, you. I any other questions? Um, the only one is this is a very small one, so it's more for curiosity is, you have a fine arts center in town. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Splendid. Does the school run that, or does the community run that? Because I own. just couldn't tell. I thought it's it its own organization, okay. but we are very active in interweaving things with them. Uh, it, and I'll just leave it at that in terms of the okay. detail. But it, it is two separate organizations. We have a wonderful school-based auditorium in what's called Central Intermediate that uh, private donations upgrade. It's a, I hate to call it Art Deco, but it's a 20s, 30s style that was totally rejuvenated and it's a wonderful facility that we use primarily for the school activity. All right, because I saw that and I thought, and I know that you're very proud of your music and art programs. Yes. Um, we have an excellent music and art program also, so I don't want to be in comparison. Um, but I was curious on how that works because ours is run by the school and I didn't know if you, no. so I was just kind of curious what I went by that. I want to thank you for taking the opportunity to uh, talk with me tonight. Um, I, certainly you weren't as nervous as I was, but uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you for coming. Much. Be safe getting back home. Well, I'm only going to the motel. <laughs> <laughs> you got to go tomorrow. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good evening. Wayne, thank you very, very much. And as you're walking out, I'll speak to the board. Um, it's 837. If by 10 till, let's see, yeah, that would give us 15 minutes, uh, we could reassemble. And I'd ask you to take the time during that 15 minutes to consider, like we talked last night, mm -hmm. consider what he had to say, um, put that in conjunction with everything else and all the other candidates. Can you take a bathroom break during that 15? Please do. Uh, but come back prepared at 8.50 to begin the dialogue of the candidates. And contrary to what we talked about last night, got feedback from several of you right after the meeting. We'll do a quick poll of board members at that time just to see if there's obvious agreement or not obvious agreement, and we'll go from there. And when we do come back, I'll be calling Lynn to participate in that discussion by cell phone. She's traveling across the country. Okay.